I'm joined now by Nicholas Cage, um, Linus Roach, and director Panos Kosmatos from Mandy here, premiering at Sundance. Guys, thanks so much for sitting down with me today. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Let's dive right into Mandy. It's a story about vengeance, about rage. Take us through the story a little bit. We'll start with you, Panos. Um, well, it's, the story starts with uh, Red, Red Miller and Mandy Bloom, who have sort of are two damaged people who have sort of found a little oasis together and are living kind of blissfully apart from society. And then, uh, because of the horrors of the male ego, as personified by Linus Roach, uh, he sees Mandy and decides that he needs, wants, needs to possess her as he feels he's uh, entitled to possess all things that he desires. And uh, their whole world is, uh, is torn apart. Okay, Linus, let's talk about your character since he kind of just uh, alluded to it. Um, what was the preparation for a role like that? What's the reaction been? Um, well, the preparation, I suppose, was, you know, I've done a fair bit of navel gazing in my life, a little bit of introspection. I've worked with some spiritual teachers along the way, so I, some of these dynamics were familiar to me, but Panos and I just talked a lot about what we understood as the kind of depravity of the male ego when it runs rampant, and this, this character was a really an opportunity to take that all the way to the sort of enlightened ego, the guy who thinks he's the messiah, but it's really the ego that's in charge, and he just wants ownership and possession of everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it was beautifully written by Pano. So in terms of preparation, when you've got good writing, the, you, yeah, a lot falls on you, but it's there. It's there for you to embody. And of course, it's Nick, it's your first time working with Panos. I've heard you're a, a big fan. Were you a big fan of his last film, Rainbow? Oh, yeah. No, that was really what put the hook in me. I, uh, I saw that movie, and uh, I didn't sleep for a week. I mean, it was <laughs> powerfully disturbing and uh, beautiful at the same time, much like what I experienced last night, mm -hmm. like a bad dream, hallucinogenic and hard to quantify, hard to describe, difficult to du duplicate, hard to describe, um, but uh, it's uniquely Panos. And I knew after seeing uh, Rainbow that I wanted to walk in that world. Right. And, uh, and when I read the script, I saw the notes that I could uh, hit in terms of my own life experience and emotional resource so I could play Red uh, organically, mm -hmm. authentically. Now, some people are saying this is kind of like a vintage cage rage, you know, we're seeing you go full cage. How do you prepare <clears throat> for something like that go, to go so deep emotionally? For me, film performance is like music, and uh, I think all great art aspires to be music. And so when I look at the dialogue and then I hear it in my head, I listen to the, the melody. Mm -hmm. And so there's a like a line in the movie, I don't think this was in the script, but she rips my shirt and I say, did you rip my shirt? Did you rip my shirt? And so it's like music. It may sound like it's cage rage or whatever you want to call it or <laughs> insanity or over the top, but for me, it's, it's, there's a, some thought went into how I want to sing the song. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, okay, so Panos, you've said this is an exhale to your first film we were just talking about beyond yeah. uh, The Black Rainbow. What's the relationship between these two? Well, I think I started writing this movie at the same time as Black Rainbow, even though I made Black Rainbow first, and they're they're both dealing with two sides of the same coin after my, uh, my parents dying, and Black Rainbow sort of dealt with the sublimation of my of my of my grief, mm -hmm. and this film deals with the sort of uh, the, the acceptance of it and the sort of the uh, the uh, expulsion of that of that, mm -hmm. of that grief. And what do you hope audiences take away from Mandy? Uh, I hope they're immer they feel immersed by by the, by the movie. You know, I feel I hope that they feel a lot, a lot of emotions when they're watching it. I think it's a very emotional, operatic rock opera. Mm -hmm. Now, Nick, I'm going to bring it back to you. This is your first time in competition at Sundance, which is kind of hard to believe. Um, so, what's it like to have a, be in a film here at Sundance? Well, uh, first and foremost, I'm I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, it's great to be invited by true film enthusiasts. Mm -hmm. You know, these people really care about cinema. I don't believe we're in competition, but it's the first time I've ever had a movie premiere at Sundance. I was here maybe 20 years ago for like a Q&A and a retrospective, which was a wonderful time for me. But to have a movie invited to premiere here is a, is a great moment for me. Mm -hmm. Um, before I let you guys go, we cover a lot of OTT and, you know, streaming on here on Cheddar. So what do you guys think of this changing the landscape for directors, for actors, just for the film industry in general? 
I don't know what OTG is. What is OTG? Oh, it's over, over the, the top. top. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you know, I've you know, heard that a lot. Yeah, we're talking. You know, this, this, you know, Netflix, Hulu, all these right. different streaming platforms that we can watch things on now. We're oh. we're not just going to the theaters. Of course, this is about going to theater, but a lot of things can get picked up and go onto other platforms here. Does it like widen the net for creators like I, and actors? I think the more a, the more avenues for distribution there are, the more opportunities there are for for for, for different uh, different people's visions to be heard. You know, and I think yeah. that, that can only at the end of the day be a very positive thing. Yeah, an audience will they will gravitate towards the stories they want to hear. Mm -hmm. I suppose the one thing, and I don't know how to deal with this or answer it really, seeing Panos's film last night, you want people to see that film on a big screen. Yeah. You know, so I know. what's all this doing to cinema is a big question. So. Mm -hmm. But there's a big uh, chance that many movies would not be seen yeah. or not be deployed. And so any format that can deploy the, the movie is a good thing because I'm fairly certain that many studios wouldn't even touch a subject like that. It also, also depends on how you watch it at home. Right. Uh, you, know, you could I, have a big screen. Yeah, I mean, back, and also, you know, back in the ni like late 90s, I used to, you know, when I was still smoking weed, I remember I, I, I got high and I watched the movie on a small laptop, but by the end of the movie, the, the screen was like, seemed this big to me, so and I had my headphones on, so it was, you know, it was as good as a movie theater. But, <laughs> but there are rare examples of mm. movies that actually play better on television they, than they do in the theater, and I would say one of them would be David Cronenberg's video drama. Absolutely. Okay. Because Why that is, well, because... That movie is about a kind of a, a virus that's going through the, uh, the, the, the the cathode ray tube. So if you watch it on TV, it right. could happen to you. Right. Okay. So, but it has to be a cathode ray old school TV. <laughs> we don't even know where to get those anymore. Professor Oblivion. You can ask Professor Oblivion. <laughs> you guys, this has been so much fun. Thank you Thank so you. much for sitting Thank down. You. Congrats and everything. Thank All right, we're going to go back over to everyone in New York. The cathode ray is the retina to the mind's eye. <laughs> <laughs> what?